All right, let's get started. Test tubes are used in a variety of settings. It can be used in um, the OR, ER, um, outpatient settings. The main purpose is to evacuate air or fluid from the chest cavity. It can be inserted in, in, in pericardium. It is used in open heart surgery. The surgeon closes the incision. He, he anticipates that there will be fluid drainage, uh, specifically blood drainage um, resulting from the incision. So he leaves one or two chest tubes into the pericardium. That way it will drain fluid out of the, of the heart. Okay, um, not really in, in the heart, but in the pericardium, the sac surrounding the heart. In the case of the pleura, <clears throat> it's frequently used in trauma, but can also be used in non-traumatic situations wherein you have a any accumulation of air or fluid inside the pleura, <clears throat> which can uh, sometimes be dangerous. Let me show you. Discussion on chest trauma will be done next semester, uh, but we'll begin chest tube management today. Are you able to see the YouTube screen or no? Um, yes. yes, I'm able to. Okay, all right. So the example given here is a tension pneumothorax. So here we have a hole coming from inside the lung. So let's say this is a spontaneous pneumothorax. Most COPD patients, which we'll talk about today in lecture, have these blebs on the surface of the lung. This is after years of having COPD, the, the, because of the increased pulmonary blood pressure, known as pulmonary hypertension, causes these bleb blebs to form. They are, for the best description is, they're like blisters uh, filled with air on the surface of the lung, not inside. So we know the lungs filled with air, but however, these blebs occur. There could be multiple of these blebs and they can spontaneously rupture. Um, the typical non- COPD patients who develop these blebs um, also have a certain body structure. People who are tall, skinny, lanky, uh, doesn't matter male or female, they tend to form these blebs. We don't really know why, but um, again, for people who develop ten, um, spontaneous pneumothorax that have no history of COPD tend to be that profile. They're skinny, tall, and lanky. The green section here is now positive pressure. As you can see, if you compare it to the left lung, there is almost nothing in there. So the, the pleura, if you look at the pleura, which is the translucent sac here, um, surrounding each lung is like a balloon 
so the and then the the, the description um, yeah, our instructors always said was it's like putting a fist into your into a, a balloon so you have a air filled balloon and then you put your fist into it so this is now the fist it is the lung that you inserted inside it so it the sac isn't really like a plastic bag that you put something in it. it it's not like that it's not one layer it's a double layer so think of it as a balloon a really large you know birthday balloon a uh, rubber balloon that you put your fist into so now you have two surfaces on the on the balloon so there's a um Um, parietal and me, me, yeah, okay, <clears throat> visceral and parietal, okay. So the visceral layer is the one coming in contact with the lung, while the parietal layer is where the air is, is um, no, not air, there's fluid in it. So there's some fluid here inside the, between the parietal and the visceral layer, the purpose of which is so that every time the lungs expand and collapse, there's no friction. Okay, so the fluid there uh, allows for um, movement of the lung with, without friction. So that fluid is constantly produced and eliminated. Okay, about at any one time, there should only be about five, maybe 10 ml of fluid in there, not a lot at all. Just again, the, the purpose is just to prevent friction. Now, so there should be no pressure inside there because like I said, it's a it's a sac, right? So it's it's like a balloon. So you put your lung inside that, not inside the balloon, but again, the, the balloon, you put your fist in it. Can you picture that? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. Okay, for those who... So imagine this is a rubber balloon. So this is now um, somebody's um, fist, okay? This is Danielle's fist, okay? So she put her fist into that balloon and now the balloon now looks like this. She has her big fist in it. Can you picture that? Yeah. Okay, so that's what the pleura is. So this is now the pleura. So again, it has two surfaces. There's a visceral. This is the visceral coming in contact with the lung. Okay, this is the lung and this is the parietal surface so in between those there's a very small liquid there okay allowing the lung to um, slide you know uh, expand and collapse uh, and there's it's it's very well protected from friction because we have that fluid in there okay so here in the animation so we have a hole in coming from inside the lung so let's say this is a ruptured blip it doesn't have to come in from inside the lung the the hole disrupting the negative pressure can also come from outside so let's say danielle got stabbed okay or shot for instance okay or uh, yeah got stabbed with a pencil or um got shot so the hole can also come from outside and therefore the atmospheric air, which obviously has 
uh, a lot of positive pressure compared to inside uh, the thorax. Hey, remember that we are negative pressure ventilators, so the diaphragm should be right here. And the way we breathe is we the, the diaphragm constra contracts down and then air gets sucked in passively just like this. So air movement is like that because the pleura here contracts. So the pleura contracts down, air is sucked in passively. That's why you don't have to think about breathing or making any effort with breathing. So air comes in passively. Now that is only possible because we have negative pressure inside the thorax, inside this pleura specifically. The pleura has a negative pressure. So the lungs uh, are able to fill with air, you know, completely passive. However, if we now have this positive pressure building up here with every breath, if you look at the size of the, the pleural space that is now filled with this green color, this is representing air that is escaping out of the lung with each breath. And look at the size comparing the left lung and the right lung. So with each breath, more and more positive pressure is building up here. So it's slowly co collapsing the lung. And at the same time, since the mediastinum is right here, this is where your heart lodges, it's now being shifted. So this is where the heart is supposed to lie. So now, because you have positive pressure here, the lung is collapsing, the pressure is building up. So it will continue to push everything toward the unaffected side. So notice now your your um, this is your superior vena cava here, the blue, okay, this big vessel right here. It's supposed to drain into the heart. So watch what's happening to it too. It's also being compressed by this collapsing lung and by the positive pressure. So if this continues, so the lung collapses and the whole mediastinum shifts and then you have this superior vena cava compressed further. So this will result in, uh, as stated here, the uh, venous return drops, lung collapses, the patient is now having to exert so much effort just to breathe. And if you notice, the left lung is now affected as well because the mediastinum, the heart, is already pushing against it. So there's a series here all leading to shock. So this is called obstructive shock because it is an indirect pump failure. So the pump here, the heart here, will fail in a few minutes. But there's really nothing wrong with the heart, so that's why it falls under indirect pump failure. In this particular example, it's the uh, it, there are non-cardiac forces here causing pump failure, particularly um, th this um, this situation is called tension pneumothorax. Um, tension pneumothorax because this is uh, life-threatening. This is um, this can develop within a few minutes. Uh, of course, there's no more lung filling this part. So when you listen to this area, there will be absolutely no breath sounds here. It'll totally be absent. Uh, you, of course, you'll hear some lung sounds here, but uh, looking at the patient, the patient will be uh, obviously short of breath because there's no more cardiac output is um, affected. If you take a blood pressure, they'll have uh, severely low blood pressure because there's no cardiac output. Um, and the patient will die unless we uh, intervene. So that is tension pneumothorax. So therefore, this is, uh, of course, although tension pneumothorax will require a thoracotomy, um, meaning a chest tube insertion, but the emergency, of course, which we'll talk about next semester, is uh, called needle, needle thoracostomy. So they'll insert a needle first, um, huge, um, 14 or bigger. Uh, well, actually, 14 is the biggest uh, needle. So they'll insert that into the first or second intercostal space here just to relieve the air. But because there's a hole here which will take time to heal, it will be followed by another tube which will be inserted. 
So now we have chest tube. So that fluid, I mean, that accumulation there doesn't have to be always air. It can be also fluid. We have hemothorax, which is uh, accumulation of blood. And it could also be a chylothorax, C-H-Y-L-O. Chylothorax is the accumulation of lymphatic fluid, which occurs in lung cancers or any other thoracic tumors like uh, lymphoma, for instance. Right, so any cancerous condition can lead to a accumulation of, instead of air and blood, there will be accumulation of lymphatic fluid. It'll come out like um, spoiled milk, okay, like a yellowish, but but about the same, or maybe thicker than milk, okay. Any questions so far? Questions? No? Okay, let's continue. So now we have chest tubes. This is a chest tube. So the purpose is to evacuate air fluid, and that fluid can be blood or lymphatic, um, lymphatic fluid uh, from the chest cavity uh, into this box. So the equipment is based on a old principle. Of the three bottle system. Can you see the picture? Not yet. Yes. Okay, you can see it now. All right. So this is the three bottle system. It's still being used. We still have it in um, the third world specifically, although we have the commercial types already also. And some nursing homes here uh, still has this, uh, older nursing homes. Uh, maybe some hospitals too, they have it probably um, stashed somewhere. Okay, so these are three sterile, sterile bottles. If we're only draining air from the patient, or fluid, sorry. If we're only draining fluid, bottle number one will, will be enough. Hey, we really don't need um, a... Um, second or a third bottle. However, most cases will have air involved. So if you have fluid accumulation there, usually blood, there will also be air. So you need a second bottle now. So this is the actual setup. So you have three sterile bottles, each with a watertight con uh, cover. This is made of rubber. Okay, so you can stick stuff into it, uh, kind of like the same top of a vial where you can stick a needle and then it will seal uh, right after you remove the bottle. I mean, right after you remove the needle. So you stick a tube here. This one is connected to the patient. Okay, this is the patient's chest tube. This is a connection. So fluid will drop here, of course. And then if, again, if we're draining air now, so air will always escape up, okay? Uh, air won't fall here. Air always goes up, so it'll escape here. So as long as the height of the tube is way over here and the drainage should settle here. So if, of course, if this reaches higher, then you'll have to replace the bottle now. So you need to get another bottle to replace this. Meanwhile, air escapes through this vent here. So you have air coming in, air will escape there, and then it will go into the second bottle. 
The second bottle always has water. The minimum here height is about two centimeters. So that's about an inch, inch and a half maybe, uh, inch and a quarter. So the first tube here is always under that two centimeters, two centimeters of water. The purpose is to allow air to escape. So air will bubble out here, bubble comes out, air goes through the other vent. Uh, this allows for, there should be water here because if there's no water, then air could possibly re-enter here and then go back into your patient. Because remember, there's positive pressure in the atmosphere. There's negative pressure, or at least we're trying to restore negative pressure in the patient's chest. Now, this water level must be maintained at at least two centimeters height inside the second bottle. So the second bottle is your air trap, or this is called the water seal. So again, bottle number one is your drainage bottle. Bottle number two is your air trap or your water seal. Water seal is your patient's protection, really. This, this bottle is really crucial that you allow air only to go out one way and not go back in. Okay, there has to be a water seal here. And air comes out here. And then uh, to facilitate um, drainage, uh, we, we can't wait for, you know, father gravity to do its job. We need this patient to get out of the hospital sooner. So we now add a third bottle. Uh, if you look at the setup, this is called a suction control bottle. Again, this is a suction control bottle. It does not provide suction. It's a bottle okay, containing water. So it can't provide suction. Oh, what it does provide is how much suction you apply to the patient depending on the height of the water here. So you've seen measurements in your textbooks or the, during the time you were in the lab, you saw measurements that say, uh, well, in your blood pressure, for instance, um, blood pressure is measured in millimeters of mercury, right? How much the mercury rises is the measurement of your blood pressure, meaning it's using mercury, not water. Okay. So in vacuums um, or air pressure, it's measured in centimeters of water. So which one is heavier, mercury or water? Water. Mercury. Mercury is, is heavier, right? So this one is the height of the water. So if you've waded in water, let's say you uh, walked in a flood versus dry land, which one is more comfortable to walk in, water or dry land? Dry land. Yes, of course, dry land. But when you're walking in water, when you're wading, let's say in flood, uh, let's say it's knee deep now, knee deep uh, flood compared to ankle deep, which one has a higher pressure when you walk in it? Ankle deep or knee deep? Knee deep. All right, so of course the, that means that the higher the height of the water here, the higher the pressure. Normally, if the doctor doesn't write the order for uh, the suction pressure, the default is always 20 centimeters of water. So that's around nine, nine inches okay, and uh, change. So the height here is usually 20 centimeters of water. So that means the amount of pressure applied to the patient is 20 centimeters of water because that is the height of the third bottle, the, the water in the third bottle. So it's still connected to a suction source. So this one, this suction machine here, 
uh, could be wall or portable suction. If you see, it's set at around, because this is 20, 40, 80, this is about 100 or 110 centimeters of water. So here, if the wall suction, the suction source is set at, let's say, 100, and the height of the water here is 20 centimeters, how much suction is the patient receiving? Wall is 110. Bottle number three is 20 centimeters of water. And we said that bottle number three is the suction control chamber or bottle. How much suction is applied to the patient's chest? Hello? It's 731, guys. Wake up. Just I guess. Understand. I don't I don't understand the question. 80, 80, 90. Um, is that Vivian? Sheila. Oh, Sheila. So what would me what made you say 80, 90, Sheila? Because um um the it's 20 and you said 110, so I subtracted from that's the amount of air that would be inside it to suction in the patient. Um, okay, let, let's start over again. So I put 20 centimeters of water here. So it's like walking, me walking in 20 centimeters high of flood water. So I'm walking in the rain and the, the flood is 20 centimeters high. I'm walking in it. So how much pressure is applied on my on my legs, on my feet? 20. 20. So the same here, I'm applying the same amount of water in this bottle here, which we said is the suction control or the suction regulator bottle. I attached it to a wall suction because, again, this is a freaking bottle. It won't give any suction. However, it can control the amount of suction. So I have to attach it to a suction source. Okay, I have to because otherwise there will be no suction applied. However, because I put 20 centimeters of water high here inside the bottle, how much pressure is applied to the patient? How much flood water is the patient's lung walking through? 20 centimeters. 20 centimeters of water. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so it's really, again, that bottle number one is the drainage chamber. Bottle number two is the water seal. We need this because we don't want that air to go back in. So air should only go one way. And uh, again, the third bottle, the purpose of this is to facilitate the drainage. We can't wait for gravity to do the job because we want the patient to go home sooner. So we facilitate it by attaching it to a suction source and we control that suction using the third bottle. Does that make sense? So it's really the third bottle that determines how much suction is there, not the wall suction. The wall suction can even be put up to 200, whatever your suction can do. Your, your, the maximum. However, the suction applied to the patient is only as high as the height of the water in the third bottle. Any question? However, there are consequences here. If we put this suction up too high, what will happen to this water here? You have tubes here. So the suction, there's a tube here only this this um, this length of tube it does not dip into the water so it will not suck it, it can't suck it just like you guys if you have a straw in your drink but then the straw cannot reach the water level so if let's say Jordana is sucking on this straw right here but the straw is too short what will happen to this water here if Jordana sucks with all, you know, 
uh, as as you know as strong as her lungs will let her suck the the drink. What will happen to the water? It's going to start to bubble. Okay, there will be bubbling here. But will the water rise to the straw? No. Impossible. However, it will cause it to bubble. The bubbling, though, agitates the water and therefore will eventually cause it to evaporate. So that is the consequence. If you put this up too high, if you put the wall suction too high, it will cause too much bubbling. And of course, now that agitates water, it will cause some of it to evaporate. So if the water level now is used to be 20, but now it, some of it evaporated, so it's now 18 centimeters high, how much suction is the patient receiving? 18. Okay, again, it's only as high as the height of the water inside the third bottle. Any question on the three bottle system? No. All right, so let's go now to a commercial chest drainage system. So this is the same three bottle system, which now they packaged into a commercial disposable container. Not environmentally friendly because this thing is uh, disposable. Um, can't be emptied once these here, this is the bottle number one. Uh, the bottle number one here, this is more efficient though, because compared to our glass bottles that we showed earlier, those bottles only contain one liter. Okay, they are one liter bottles, so very impractical because they can only drain one liter. Most trauma patients can drain up to 2,000. Uh, 2, um, in fact, in open heart surgery, they could lose up to maybe 300 or, or more. Uh, so it's not practical. So this one is now packaged. There are the, the bottle number one has a higher capacity now. This one particular one can hold up to 2,500 of fluid. So these there are three, uh, one, two, three, four columns here. So think of it as there are plastic columns in between here, allowing wherein fluid enters the first column, rises. And when it reaches the top, this is 200, it simply spills over. So you see this plastic column here. So when it reaches that, uh, that point, so the fluid now spills over to the next column and it continues here, 201, 202, 250, and then 300. What is this? Um, 600. Okay, when it reaches 601, it spills over here. 601, continue 700, and so on. Does that make sense? Okay, and then this thing has a kickstand. This one, when, when this is inside the you know, sterile wrapper, this one, of course, it, you can you can turn this uh, 100, but no, maybe not 100, maybe um, uh, 90 degrees. OK, so you can turn this. So this is parallel here in the package. And then you when you take it out of the package, you simply turn it 90 degrees and there's a lock here. So this is now your stand he said it's a kickstand if let's say uh, somebody mess with a kickstand so this thing can topple over uh, no problem because let's say your blood your fluid now is all over the place you simply tip this over to the right tip it over it will return all the fluid back to the original columns right there's this it's really no problem um so the fluid enters here. So this is the same as the three bottle system you saw earlier. So um, fluid is collected here and then air escapes into the next bottle. So this is now your water seal bottle. This is bottle number two. 
So here is two, two centimeters of water. There's a arrow here indicating, uh, tells you to fill this level. The water is colored blue because they put a, a dye in here, also here to color it blue. Because if it's clear, then you won't see it. So you have to see um, bubbling here. Because if you look at your the bottle here, this is bottle number two. Every time air escapes, there will be bubbling. Correct? You'll see water bubble as they as the water escapes. And of course, the third bottle, uh, there will be continuous bubbling here because it's attached to a suction source. So I forgot to mention that. So nothing's happening here. It is just fluid collecting in the first bottle. And the second bottle, there should be, you should see intermittent bubbling here as air escapes. Now, if you um, imagine where the chest tube is. Probably you can't. Um, we'll watch another video to see where the bottle, where the chest tube is inserted. And so there will be intermittent bubbling here. You should see intermittent bubbling. <clears throat> and also, the water level here in bottle number two will rise and fall, rise and fall. It will rise when the patient takes a breath. When the patient inhales, lung expands, the water level will rise and then it will go back down when the patient exhales. The same thing if the patient coughs boop, boop, and then sneezes, achoo. okay, so it will also rise. Or a patient has a hiccup, for instance, <laughs> okay, the, the water level here will rise, but it should go back down. And again, the bubbling here will be intermittent as the air escapes and um, again the third bottle must continually be bubbling there should be bubbling here which indicates that you have suction that is connected to suction the patient can ambulate patient doesn't have to be connected to the suction source all the time They can be ambulating. They, they don't have to be stuck uh, in bed with this. So they can take it off suction, walk with it. So without suction, um, the the drainage is only by gravity, which is fine. Okay, we want the patient to ambulate. In fact, ambulation will help re-expand the lung. Any questions so far? Let's go back here. So this is your drainage uh, system. Let's watch how the chest tube is inserted so that we know where is the tube actually located, the chest tube. Okay, before we watch the video, so here is your, here's the heart, there's the lung, and this is a collapsed lung. So obviously this one is the one where we need to put the chest tube in. The chest tube will be inserted in this area here. So this is inside the pleura, not inside the lung. So this is your collapsed lung. It's collapsed, it cannot expand because all this area here in colored blue, are now filled with positive pressure. This positive pressure could be air or fluid, all right, preventing the lung from expanding. So we have to remove all of these fluid here, which have nowhere to go. So they're basically trapped in there, collapsing the lung, preventing this lung from expanding because they're occupying all that space here. So we need, we need to put in a chest tube 
to drain this and then attach that chest tube to our chest tube drainage system. So that condition there is now connected to this thing, which will now drain fluid, allow air to escape here with the help of our suction. So this setup is called a wet suction setup. It's called wet because the because of the third chamber here. The third chamber is wet. It is controlled by the height of the water. So if you, you can't see it very well, but there is 5, 10, 15, 20, and this is, I think, no, oh no, this is 20. This is 20. So that means this is 15, this is 10, 5, 0. Okay, yeah, makes sense. So this is 0, 5, 10, 15, 20 centimeters. You can go a little bit higher in this particular model because this one allows for, I think this is saying 25. I think that's 25. So again, it's the height of the water here. How much water you, you put here. You put water in there and you fill the water up to the 20 centimeter level. Uh, that is now the amount of suction you have applied on the patient. If again, if it evaporates and then you drop down to 18 to 15, then that means the patient is only getting 15 centimeters of water um, suction. So therefore, if it evaporates, then you have to fill it with um, the water, by the way, is uh, sterile distilled water only. Do not use saline. The manufacturer dictates that it should only be sterile distilled water because they don't leave any residue behind when they uh, evaporate. Uh, distilled water doesn't leave any powder or any anything left behind, okay, no uh, precipitates. So I said this is a wet setup. There is a dry So this thing is an example of a dry setup. So here, the same thing, we have bottle number one, three columns, bottle one number one, one, one. So this is capable of 2000, up to 2,000, 2,100 ml of drainage. This is bottle number two. This is your water seal. Same two centimeters here. It says two centimeter. There's arrow. You can't miss it. So you fill that with sterile distilled water up to the two centimeter line. And this is now your water seal. Your, this is your bottle number two. They always have this small plastic ball just to show you that, you know, it, it is tidling because it's easier if that ball is uh, in here. That way you can see it rise. So when a patient um, breathes in and then the higher the, the, the plastic bottle goes up, you know, let's say the patient takes a breath, goes up here. So that means the higher, the stronger the patient's breath, the, the, the more expanded the lungs are. Of course, if the patient can only breathe up to here, and then, then that bottle only rises because that bottle will drop here. If it rises, it only goes up to here. So the patient can't really uh, expand their lungs very well. So we can see that the, the therapy is good if, let's say, the patient's able to bring that ball up to here, kind of like the incentives parameter, if you if you think about it that way, when you're having your patient use the incentives parameter, you know, the higher that plastic ball goes up, then the better the lung expansion. And this is now your suction control uh, bottle. As you can see, it's dry. There's nothing, there's nothing wet in here. What you have is this accordion thing. And here's your dial. It's controlled by, there's a, um, a dial on the side here, which you turn and you can move this. So from 20 centimeters, you just turn that dial here on the side. So if you turn it, this will turn up to 25, 30, 35, 40. So the main difference between the wet and the dry 
you saw the wet which is capable of only 20, maybe 25 centimeters of suction, a centimeters of water suction. This one is capable up to 40. So this, uh, two differences here. In the first place, this one is dry. It's, it's based on the, whether it's dry or wet is based on the third bottle. If the third bottle or the suction regulator is dry, like let's say this one, this is a dry setup and they have a catchy name. This particular brand calls it Oasis because Oasis is found in a dry desert. Okay, catchy. And they have, uh, this is a dry suction control chamber. Uh, so that's the first difference. The other one was wet because it's filled with water. This one is dry because there's no water in it. The second difference is this one is capable of applying higher suction. The other one is only 20, maybe 25 in some models. This one can give you up to 40. So I'd say you need the, the dry for trauma patients because usually trauma patients require higher suction. Non-traumatic patients well, they sell them. I've actually I've never seen them require more than 20 centimeters. Doctor only gives them 20. But for trauma, say huge uh, chest injuries, like stab wounds or gunshot wounds, they, they get um, higher, maybe 30 or even 40. Uh, it really depends on how much fluid you want to remove from the air or fluid you want to remove from the pleura. Um, but really, you can do everything with the dry, plus this one is less less maintenance because there's no water that will evaporate, so therefore you don't have to keep filling it. Um, I really don't know why they made the wet um, setup because we have the dry now, which is very convenient. Questions? No questions. All right, let's go to textbook. All right, so how do we care for this thing? So I told you the what was expected. So bottle number one, we want this to just, you know, do nothing. It will just collect the fluid, whatever fluid we're removing, blood, lymphatic fluid, whatever. Second bottle should tidal. So this should go up with inhalation and then down with in exhalation. Same thing, same movement should be observed when the patient yawns, coughs, sneezes, or gets a hiccup. The third bottle in a wet, wet setup should continuously bubble when connected to suction. Again, this part here should be continuous bubbling. This one here only intermittent. It should only bubble intermittently when the patient exhales. So again, the water here rises with inhalation and drops down and bubbles intermittently during uh, exhalation or coughing, sneezing, yawning, or hiccuping while the third bottle should be bubbling if connected to suction. Of course, if it's disconnected to suction or you're just something wrong with the suction source, then of course there will be no bubbling here. Questions? No. Okay, uh, so let's just watch this really quick. Uh, we're not inserting the chest tube, but it's um you now we can appreciate where the why the chest would um no i mean the the water seal would do what it's doing
I've actually never seen a patient supine when we insert a chest tube because, of course, the patient is gasping for air here. Uh, unless the chest tube, I mean, the um, fluid or air accumulation is still minor, but that's not usually the case. Uh, we insert it uh, when the patient is already symptomatic. Uh, so I'm guessing they only put this patient supine for demonstration purposes. You see these holes at the tip of the chest tube. These are called eyelets, like small eyes, E-Y-E-L-E-T-S, eyelets. So if you see this, that term used on a test question, that's what they're calling. Uh, that's what they're referring to, okay? These are the eyelets or the drainage holes on the chest tube. All right, so you saw how it was inserted, so you know where it is, right? So the chest tube is in the pleura and it is connected to this system. So now you know why flu blood will collect here or any fluid will collect here. Air escapes through here, causing uh, bubbles intermittently as the air escapes and then this also rises and falls because if if you imagine that where the tube is and then when that lung inflates or expands it will push whatever air is in the pleura as they inhale causing this fluid to rise and then of course when the lung exhales or collapses, water level go, goes back down. Can you picture that? Yeah. Okay, all right. And here's the reason for the suction. Okay, it will assist in re-expansion re of the lung. So, of course, later, when the lung has fully re-expanded, meaning the hole that was in the lung is now closed 
meaning it, it will take time for that hole to close on its own. Uh, once it's closed, do we still have air escaping into the pleura? No. No more. So therefore, will you still see any anything happening? Any operation, you know, happening to the water sealed chamber? If there is no more air, no more water, no, okay, no more. So if there's no more activity in this chamber, that would be possibly what's happening. However, if those islets, the holes that I talked to you about earlier, if those holes are clogged by whatever, let's say a blood clot or something, anything else that, that clogged it, will it do the same? Yes, it would stop. Okay, so there's only two possibilities here. If it happens within the first 24, 48 hours, is this supposed to stop tidling and stop bubbling intermittently? Unlikely, right? No, not unlikely. So if that happens, that is reportable to the, to the physician, meaning the physician must be notified, hey, it's only been two days. I don't see any bubbling anymore. There's no intermittent bubbling and it's not tidling. Nothing's happening. So he has to go in because the only possible explanation is those eyelids are clogged with something. So there is now obstruction and it is dangerous because remember, there could be still air and fluid accumulating there, which we are not removing because it's obstructed. So that is a emergency, meaning the drainage stops or there is no more intermittent bubbling or tidling in the first 24 to 48 hours. So that's dangerous. So we call physician regarding that. Um, uh, professor? Yes. Uh, so you see how you said like um, the hole would heal on its own? So in the lung, yes. Do they leave like the suctioning thing in there while it's healing? The chest tube? Yes, that's the yeah. whole purpose of a chest tube because we wait until that hole closes because we're not going to do surgery to plug that hole. I mean, it's a small hole. It will spontaneously heal. We just need time. But after it heal and like the suction is still in there, like when it's time to take out the suction, wouldn't you still be left with a hole? Um, you mean on the on the patient's chest wall, right? Not yeah. The, okay, yeah. Uh, don't worry, because you remember the video, how big was the incision made? Yeah, uh, as far as like the point two, of the... Yeah, two to three centimeters, right? So it's yeah. about an inch. It's only about an inch long. It will heal spontaneously on its own. The track will close. In fact, if this chest tube is taken out prematurely, that's an, another emergency because now the hole, the track might close. So the doctor needs to come back in and reinsert that chest tube if the patient still needs it. Because remember, not something is still going on inside the pleura. We need to remove that air, that fluid out of the pleura because otherwise the lung cannot expand. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So as long as the patient needs it, that chest tube must be in there. We need to keep removing that fluid, that air, because I showed you what will happen earlier. If that air and fluid accumulates in the pleura with nowhere to go. So that's why we put a chest tube in order to drain that out so that the lung can expand. Because if we, can, we don't remove that, you saw the lung collapse. Correct? Yeah. But okay. I mean, it, as far as like uh, in the pleura itself, like after you take out the suction, would there be a hole in the pleura? Yes, but again, it uh, the, the only thing keep, let me put it this way, the only thing keeping it open is because the tube is there. Once you remove the tube, the track will close. Oh, okay. 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 <clears throat> All right. Because the, we didn't take any tissue, we only, we only made a, you saw the video, we only made a vertical incision. Yes. Yeah, so the, I mean, you, you cut any meat with a, um, you know, you cut steak, fresh steak with um, 
in a sharp knife, you make a um, a incision through it. When you take out the blade, do you see a hole? No. No. So it oh it will continue. It will automatically close the track, okay, and it will heal spontaneously within you know a few hours. It's 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 closed already. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, okay, so we know. Yes. Um, so in the video, it says the test, the tube is inserting um, superiorly. I'm just wondering, um, like, would how do you drain the fluid or air in the lower lobe of the lung then? Okay, uh, they put it there because when the patient will eventually lay down, right, to bed to sleep. Correct. So you still you like after that you. You prefer to place patient in supine instead no. of um... no, no, not at all. We want the patient to be ambulating, but like I said, eventually that patient's gonna lay down, right? So that will now facilitate drainage when they are laying down. Don't worry about the when they're up upright and walking because as long as the patient's lung is expanding, it will push that air toward that side. Uh, you're, you, uh, let's say when, when you're in the dentist's office, okay, the, the, the dentist is, uh, or your dental hygienist is, is cleaning. Remember they put uh, a tube, a drainage tube in your mouth while they're, they're drilling and cleaning because there's, they're spraying a lot of water mm -hmm. in your mouth. Yeah. Okay, kind of like that. So if you close your mouth, even if the 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 the, uh, the drainage tube, the, the suction tube is only on the left side of your mouth, and you have water on your right side, when you close your mouth, didn't it suck everything out anyway? I don't remember, but okay. No, I mean uh, again, the when you're in the dentist office, so when you're having your teeth clean, and the the dental hygienist is using this instrument that's continuously spraying water inside your mouth. Even if the suction tube was only on the left side or the right side of your mouth and you had water accumulating on the other side, didn't it suck, suck it out anyway? Especially if you close your mouth? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. So that's also what's happening in the chest wall. So the, the, the drainage tube, the eyelets don't have to be uh, touching, actually immerse or submerge in the fluid. It will suck everything out. Because remember, you have, you have this thing attached to suction. Okay, so as the lung moves, as the lung expands, it's the equivalent to you closing your mouth. And then the, all that fluid, wherever they are, will still get sucked out. I don't know if you can imagine it that way. Yeah, okay, I got it, thank you. Okay. But um, they put it, uh, yeah, they put the tube aiming superiorly that way when you lay down, uh, it will still uh, continuously drain the fluid out or suck the fluid out. Okay, let's go to your responsibility. So what do you do as a nurse? Just like any other respiratory patient, you monitor every two to four hours, uh, listen to lung sounds. You still have the patient do deep breathing okay, while the chest tube is in, especially if the, they have a chest tube. So have them use the incentive spirometer, uh, do deep breathing and coughing exercises, nothing, nothing different. Maintain a closed system. You should not um, at any time uh, disconnect it. Uh, the only time we disconnect it is if we need to change the drainage system, meaning it's full. The, the, the first chamber is now full. You need a new one. So yes, we, um, we have to disconnect the system. Um, of course, we also clamp, okay? We have to clamp because otherwise, so we clamp here. And we also clamp the chest tube because we're disconnecting this now uh, to and then connecting it to a new system. So to prevent air from entering the the pleura um, during disconnection, 
you have to clamp that way because you lose the protection. This is remember, this is what's protecting your patient from the atmospheric air, the water seal. So when you're disconnecting this, then the patient loses the protection of the water seal. So therefore you have to clamp the chest tube and clamp the drainage system only for a few seconds while you switch it over, right? It's dangerous when you clamp because imagine if you're clamping, you are stopping the, the drainage of air and fluid and that could create so much pressure in the thorax, the patient will have difficulty breathing and could cause a pneumothorax. So we clamp only for a few seconds when we are changing the system. The only other time that we are clamping is if we're checking for leaks. If there is continuous bubbling here, then that can only mean there's a leak somewhere. And the frequent site of the leak is where the chest tube was connected to this system. Remember at the end of the video earlier, the narrator said, um, connect the chest tube to the, connect the end of the chest tube to a chest drainage apparatus, chest drainage apparatus. Remember that part? So they connected where the chest tube was connected to this system somewhere here. That's the really the um, the part where it um, where, where there's a leak. Sometimes it's also around the insertion site of the chest tube, because remember we had a vertical incision and then we put something round in, through it, so it's not a perfect fit. So there's there's bound to be some leaking uh, around the edges. Can you picture that? Um, let me show you a picture of Okay, you see this? So this is a, this is petroleum gauze. So this is where the chest tube is inserted. And we wrap it with, this is a bad job though. Um, let's see if there's something better. No. Okay, so this is your petroleum gauze. See how it's folded? This is sterile. So with sterile gloved hands, what you do is wrap it around the insertion site. Okay, not like this, this is a mess. So you wrap it around the insertion site just to seal it. And then after you apply the petroleum gauze, you put a drain sponge like this. And we don't really need to use this because it doesn't have to be airtight. Um, they put one stitch like this just onto the skin just to, you know, stabilize it, but really won't hold much. Um, but we, after this one, we cover it with, we put some gauze and then use a drain sponge to cover it. What we really use to tape this, tape the thing is either like this or we put a foam tape. Foam tape is a pressure dressing. It gives the patient more peace of mind, like uh, assurance, you know, that it's really a tight, secure dressing. It won't move. So, um, yeah, so that's um, that's a better uh, tape. It, it, it's foam tape. So that's, this is typically where, so where the, the other leak is. Again, the leak would either be from the connection, um, right here where the i oh know right here so where the chest tube this is the chest tube and this is the drainage system where they tape this part here especially if somebody uses plastic tape we should really be using foam tape to to secure it that way you don't get any leaks so again two possible sites to see a leak is here 
or more frequently right here where you have the, the two connected. Uh, we simply tape it. Okay, we, so we secure if there's in a continuous bubbling here in the water seal, that means we have a leak. So again, two places it can leak right here or right here. So you just check. The way you check is, of course, you have to clamp. So if you clamp right here and clamp right here, the drainage, I mean, the leak stops, then the leak is right here. So if you clamp, um, after you tape it though, and then the, the, the leak continues, then the only other possible explanation is leaking right here. So this one first, and then this one next. Questions? All right, let's continue. No. All right, so tape all connections. Mm, OK, so just like a Foley bag, we keep the collection apparatus, the box, uh, below the chest. OK, just like if you have a Foley, you put the Foley bag below the patient's bladder. Um, you shouldn't see any loops. OK, that's dangerous. That's equivalent to clamping. So make sure you don't have any of that. What will cause a um, possible obstruction is you see this loop right here okay this is called a dependent loop because the entire length of the tube is about six feet. You can't cut this. It has to remain that length, six feet. This is, um, this is one way to prevent it, but uh, again, you still have a dependent loop here though. So the best way to do this is to put this pole where you tie this thing over here at the, at the end of the bed, that way, that you keep this this tube this piece of tubing um, up above this box because if you if you think about it if there's anything let's say there's blood draining here blood will come down here come down here and then settle right here so the blood cannot go straight into the box because you have a loop here remember the uh, the blood is only draining by gravity and you don't have that much drainage. So some drainage will stay here. So let's say it's been there for several hours now. Okay, because they want nobody lifted this to facilitate the drainage. So blood might clot here. So that's the same effect as you are clamping the tube. Okay, so if you have um, a blood clot now form here because the, the blood coagulated, now you've obstructed it. So a patient could have increased pressure building up there now. So we don't want that happening. So avoid dependent loops like this. Put it up on the bed like this. But uh, again, because of this short distance here, if you therefore stretch it that way, you don't have any dependent loop. The the, the tube will will um, the tube should drain straight into the box. No dependent loops like this. Okay, next. Um, okay, we, so we talked about this fluctuation, so please read that again. Um, yes, we measure. Okay, the um, drainage amount should only be 70 ml per hour. This should be the maximum, unless the doctor gives you a different number. So for large trauma patients, for instance, it may be more than 70 ml per hour. Or if you, he, if you see this red, warm, free-flowing, then that's bleeding, obviously. Or if it co looks cloudy, then there's an infection. I know they say here, never clamp the test tube, but we did have to clamp. 
what were those two instances where we clamped? Taking it out. When we have to change the tube. Okay. Um, it's when we change the tube. I mean, we, we change the drainage, right? The drainage. The drainage, yeah. yeah. What was the other instance where we had to clamp? When you're testing for leakage. For leaks, all right. When we're looking for leaks. Again, only clamp for a few seconds at a time. You never clamp for longer than a few seconds. Because that will, again, um, result in a tension in your motorax. But of course, uh, when whenever you clamp, don't forget to unclamp. All right. Uh, the dressing, yeah, dr the dressing is usually changed every day unless the doctor dictates otherwise. Uh, I already said the patient should be ambulating with the tube. You don't have to continuously, you know, uh, 24 hours on a suction. They can be off suction. They can ambulate. Uh, in fact, ambulation will, you know, prevent other complications like you, you, your patient now gets a DBT or pneumonia because you're not allowing them to ambulate. Okay so when we remove this remember we only have a two to three centimeter incision there it will take uh, a few hours to close that so when you remove it or well, the doctor removes it uh, you should have this ready so you apply a sterile occlusive petroleum jelly dressing and usually they leave it on for two or three days and then just take it out. Sometimes they're afraid to take it out thinking the hole is still there. Um, not really. Um, 24 hours or, or longer, the track is already closed. Same thing with any other incision, let's say a peg tube. When you take out a, when the doctor removes a peg tube or takes out a tracheostomy, you know, not a the patient doesn't have a stoma, of course, so you just have a temporary tracheostomy. So same track was uh, all of these, the peg tube, the uh, tracheostomy and the chest tube. There was only a um, straight incision. OK, so the only thing keeping them open is because there is a tube there. So there's a chest tube, there's a peg tube, there's a tracheostomy tube keeping it open. But once we take them out, the track should close. And that's about it. OK, another thing is, let's say. It. Um, the tube was pulled out. We we didn't intend to okay, the patient forgot they have a chest tube, got up ran to the bathroom and didn't bring the the box with them they, they had to go and so they forgot so they pulled the whole test tube out what do you do you cover the um the hole so no air gets okay, in so the you test. cover the um incision with a dry sterile gauze. That's all you do. Just dry sterile gauze and then yell for help. Actually, you yell for help first and then you cover that thing. So somebody should be coming in to um, assess it. If the patient still needs it, they'll put a new one in. If not, they'll leave it out. What if it gets disconnected? from the drainage system, wherein you don't have your water seal anymore. Let me tell you, you what put, You about. put that little bit in sterile water. All right, so we, so this part here is disconnected. I don't know how that would happen, but let's say this, this part here got disconnected. So we lost the water seal protection. So you have to dip this whole chest tube, the end of it, inside a bottle of sterile distilled water until somebody can get you a new one. Because now that that part is contaminated, we can't clean it. So you have to get a new setup. 
because it has to be sterile when connected to the test tube. Mm, that's it. Any question? I don't have. Go ahead. I say I don't have any. Oh, okay. How about the rest of you? No. 